Hey everybody, it's Matt Dabbs here at Wineskins. I want to talk about something that goes along with this conversation about declining numbers of congregations and, and churches of Christ that has been going on now for some time. And that is a, a something else that we don't really talk about very often, and it's the declining number of people who are preaching. The declining number of people who are in a lead minister role or even any kind of ministry role at all, that number is really declining. And I, I want to talk about some of the numbers on that and talk about exactly why I think that's the case. And then as always, I want to talk about some things that we can do to help improve that down the road. We don't want to just be uh, deconstructing, but always reconstructing so that we're putting things back better than we found them. So we're not just over here just being a critic. So Barna has looked at the numbers on ministers for quite some time, run the stats on them, and some of the numbers, the trends that we're watching happen over time are kind of alarming a bit. So half of ministers currently in the United States are 55 or over. The average age of ministers in the United States is 54. Now that's changed since 1992. It's up, the age is up 25% since 1992. Since 1992, the number of ministers 65 and over has moved from 6% to 17%, 65 and over. So almost one in five of ministers in, in North America or the United States are uh, 65 or older. And they found that those under 40, ministers under 40, has fallen, 1992 it was 33% under the age of 40, and it is now at 15%. So we have this aging population. We have a lack of younger people in ministry. The numbers are going up as congregational age is going up, as the average age of people in the churches is going up, the average age of ministers is also going up. Now, if we had a pipeline, what this really demonstrates is um, this is not necessarily the problem in and of itself. The numbers are not actually the problem. The shortage is not actually the problem. The shortage is a symptom. We need to think about these things in terms of the symptoms, but then the actually underlying problem that is really causing these things. When we talk about the actual causes, then we can talk about solutions. If we're just talking about symptoms, then it's really hard to actually talk about solutions. And if all we do is talk about symptoms and, and, and alleviating symptoms, we're just talking about making ourselves more comfortable and not actually addressing the underlying problem that's driving the symptomatology that we're seeing in our churches. So I ran the numbers in 2018 on 119 Church of Christ ministers. And what I found was that the average age that they stayed in a congregation was six years and that they had been on average in three congregations. And of the people in this survey who were asked, what do you think your next professional position is going to be? Will it be ministry? Will it be retirement? Will it be something else? About 10 to 12% said the next thing they're gonna do is retire, but about 44% said that their next move, professional move, would not be congregational ministry. So think about this for just a moment. We have an aging population of ministers amongst aging congregations and aging membership. And along with that, we have of the ones who are currently in ministry who are aging out, we have almost half who are saying that their next position will probably not be congregational ministry. So, and their average term is six years. So within six years, it could well be that we could possibly lose 44% if people actually follow through on what they said of our ministers. Now, if we had a solid pipeline of people coming in on the back end, that would not be as much of a problem. We'd say, well, that's fine because we have all these people in the wings who are waiting for positions, looking for positions, but the problem is we really don't have that. And I'm going to speak a little bit anecdotally here based on a lot of conversations and my understanding on the, the situation, and you're welcome to, to chime in with your experience on this. So we have fewer people training for ministry. From what my conversations with people in higher ed is it's getting harder and harder to recruit people to our seminaries, people to our graduate institutions of education. We have some phenomenal graduate education programs in Churches of Christ. The work that's going on at ACU, the work that's going on at HST, at Harding School of Theology, the work that's going on at Lipscomb and Pepperdine and places like that, it's wonderful. And the professors are amazing people and the education is, is just out of this world. I mean, we have some really phenomenal people who are training up and coming people. But if you don't have a pipeline of people coming in, then you, you really are still underwater. You're still upside down. So we have fewer and fewer people who are training for full-time ministry. Pair that with our current ministers, who half of which, 44%, are saying that their next employment may not be congregational ministry, probably will not be congregational ministry. And we start to see a real, real problem 
emerging. When I was at the University of Florida in my first graduate education experience, uh, you really have this feel that you are trying to become your professors, that they're really modeling and mentoring you to be like them. And one of the things, the shifts that we've experienced since the 1960s in Churches of Christ is, and I mentioned this in a previous video, and this is not a criticism, it's an observation, because I'm the beneficiary of some amazing graduate education at Harding School of Theology in Memphis. Uh, they didn't pay me to say that. I, I love what they do, and, and I love their uh, professors and their approach. They're doing great work, and I highly recommend them. So we, uh, we had this shift from bivocational minister professors who had their foot in the academy and they had their foot in the congregation. And what we've seen over time through accreditation standards and the, um, the need for professors to go to get a PhD, and I was corrected on this in a previous video, we do have one uh, higher ed institution with Ambridge who does offer a PhD, I think a New Testament study. So it does exist in Churches of Christ. I want you to know that. I want you to be aware of, of what they're doing and that, that does actually exist. Historically, that's not been something that's been available as in a, a, a doctorate, as in a PhD from a Church of Christ accredited university. We offer doctors of ministry, we offer masters of divinity, we offer you know these different master's degrees. But if you wanted a PhD, you had to go to Hebrew Union, or you had to go to Yale, or you had to go to Columbia. You know, you had to go to these different universities that were not Church of Christ affiliated. That's actually a good thing because we have to get out of our bubble and learn from other people and get a, a broader and bigger perspective. But But what that means is we have people who have dedicated Again, this is good. I'm not criticizing. I love this personally, is we have people who've devoted their lives to professional academic study and, and, and teaching. It's wonderful. I'm indebted to it. But what ends up happening is, I think, this is my hunch, is that if you have students who are coming up through that and they're not seeing their professors as people who are actively engaged in congregational ministry, then you, you really have people who are attracted to programs to become academicians, which is uh, needed, it's fine, it's, it's wonderful, but I think that over time the, the numbers of people training for ministry and the numbers of people training for academia have flip-flopped and we see less people who are really interested in that congregational ministry position. Uh, and again, these are all symptoms. I'm not talking about problems. Do they create problems? Does this create problems for churches? It certainly can, but it's not the actual problem. There's another set of problems that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And then we have some theological shifts that come along with a widening generation gap. So the, the generation that's coming up won't see eye to eye with the people in the aging pew. The people in the pew are not going to align with the people who are coming out of the theological education with master's degrees, you know, training and ready for ministry. That, that gap is widening, that gap is growing. We're seeing amongst our young people more of a push for universalism, let's say. Uh, we're say, seeing from our young people a push for, you know, various things socially and politically that, that doesn't may not really jive with a lot of people in the pew. And so the fit, the, the, the theological and generational cultural fit is becoming more and more misaligned between the churches that currently exist and the people who are who are being trained and, and their beliefs, you know, coming into and coming out of, of seminary. And again, these are not the actual problem, these are just symptoms. And so you have a generation that's looking for ministerial positions in aging congregations who have a whole different worldview, a whole different culture than the churches that they're entering. And then you have aging churches with aging members looking to probably keep things pretty much the same, where you have a younger generation that's more interested in change, social justice, you know, reaching out to the margins, which could make people in the existing congregations highly uncomfortable. Not that we're here to make people comfortable. And so there's just a disconnect and it's it's really a fit issue. And I think people know that and they're not really attracted to uh, the ministerial positions, the congregational ministerial positions. But think about even being a parent. And I'm just going to ask you this question if you're a parent, would you want your child to enter into congregational ministry? And, and I am one and, and I've been very fortunate to be able to do the work that I do and to minister to people and to love on people and to communicate the gospel to people and preach from the pulpit and you know just the my kind of ministry I've been able to do has, has really changed my life I'm very indebted to it and, and so this is not anti anything when I say this I'm I'm just describing um, something that that is it's already here the shortage is, is already here and we're gonna have to address this if we're going to have a clear path forward. So let's talk about the problem. What really is the underlying problem? I think we really push too hard into the professionalized business model ministry paradigm 
and saying, okay, well, you have those who are theologically trained and educated, and they're able to do these things, but then you have people who come, and they sit, and they consume, and they give, and they're not engaged in ministry. It's called the Pareto Principle, which is 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and so you're not seeing people engaged in ministry. We relegated and delegated ministry out to the professionals because that's the kind of world we live in. You know, you want to work on, uh, have your car fixed. You, you can't hardly do it in your garage and at your house anymore. you got to take it to somebody. All these computers and things, that everything has been professionalized. It's a cultural shift that we have to recognize. And people treat church just like they treat everything else. You leave those things to the professionals. The professionals need to teach. The professionals need to preach. The professionals need to reach the lost. The professionals need to visit the hospital. The professionals need to visit the shut-ins. And so the work of ministry is just is, is relegated down to a very small priestly class and so I think we took this business model too too far and when you do that you don't have as many people engaged in ministry and if you don't have as many people engaged in ministering to other people then you don't really have an interest bubbling up to do ministry the more exposure we can give to young people and to people in the congregation to actually go out and be people who minister to others the more people are going to be interested in pursuing ministry and again I think we've professionalized it far far too much and we need to have a more organic approach to identify identifying people with giftedness and equipping them and blessing them and sending them from existing congregations and also recognizing people who have a real knack and a real talent for learning, for education and ministry to be able to send them off to receive further education from our institutions of higher learning to come back and bless our congregations. Our congregations, and here's where our universities are strong, need deep, rich theological education and mission. And I believe that our universities are doing a fantastic job of teaching those things. But if their people are not coming to receive the education, then to go into congregational ministry to apply it, then again, we're, st we're stuck again. And so let me talk about what, the, what I think the problems really are. First again is professionalized ministry. We just took that ship and sailed it way too far. The second is that there's been a cultural shift in the way people see ministers. A hundred years ago, ministry a minister was highly respected. Churches in the center of the community things organize and gather themselves around the church and around the, the, the faith community. The preacher is seen as a highly respected position in the community. And so, you know, the preacher might be invited to certain community events just along with the mayor and other people. And so there's been a shift in the way that we see ministries and ministers in general. And, and then people see what happens to the preacher's family oftentimes. The preacher's family gets put under the microscope. They say, well, I wouldn't want that for my kids. You watch how preacher's kids turn out sometimes not so well. They say, I wouldn't want that for my kids. We have parents who see this and don't want to, you know, rec uh, who don't want to recommend congregational ministry to their kids. It's like, well, be anything else. Be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a, you know, a, a custodian, whatever you need to be, but just please don't go into ministry because they see what has happened to so many minister families over the years and they don't want to see that happen to their, their kids and their, their grandkids. And so there's not a real um, enthusiasm or push and encouragement to identify gifts, to identify calling, which we are very lax on. We have a very low sense of calling, which I think is a real thing. And so we're not identifying gifts and encouraging people to use them for congregational ministry because we don't want to see people go through these great difficulties. I mean, think about a minister because we've blended business and spiritual position and we've put them into a corporation called church. So when a minister goes on vacation, it's like this question, can I even post my pictures online? Because someone's going to say, well, wow, that's a real waste of the Lord's money to go to the beach, you know, because we've blended in this this business and, and job position in with a spiritual um, nature of the position and it gets very murky very very difficult to to navigate and so what happens in the life of the preacher the minister is that we all we live in one circle so if you're a dentist and you lose your job then you keep your family you keep your friends you know you keep all these other circles are like separate out from your job but when you're in ministry if you if you lose your job you lose your friend circle you lose your job circle you lose your faith family circle all those circles are the same circle and so there's a lot of devastation that happens in minister families when a minister is fired or loses their job and that kind of carnage that kind of uh, devastation or hurt is noticed by the congregation and again so that's one more motivation for people to not you know, encourage their children to go into one of the most meaningful and helpful professions a human being could ever enter into, but it does come with a great cost. So I think we need to rethink what church is and what it truly requires. And we, we need to, to, to move from larger to smaller. We need to move from inflexible to flexible, from fixed to nimble, from large gathering, from looking at backs of heads, to tables and circles. 
we need to really engage ourselves in the life of fellow Christians and in the mission of the church to make disciples. I, th I really think if young people could look at the church and see it as an outpost for mission, an outpost for changing the world, they truly would be more interested in being engaged in it. But our young people, I'm just being brutally honest here, our young people don't look at church and see it as a place where they would have opportunity to change the world. And if we can change that, I hate to say change that perception, if we can change that reality, because unfortunately that is true sometimes, you know, if, if we can change that and we can get back to mission and get back to our purposes and not just be doing things to get through it, then I, I think, and I'm not accusing all churches or even my church of doing that, I'm just saying it generally speaking, uh, we need to have our churches be outposts for mission where we're truly engaged in the lives of others. We have a supportive community uh, around the ministers and their families. And I think people, if they saw the ministerial position as a place of encouragement, support, of love, of mutual um, affirmation and encouragement, that this was a place where someone could thrive and be on mission and change the world, people might be more willing to encourage their children to, to have a vision for that and then to pursue theological education for that. So be on the lookout for the, the people, the young people in your midst to have uh, a real knack for service, a love for the Lord, a knowledge of scripture, a desire for God, and a, and a desire for mission, and, and just start encouraging them, start equipping them, start walking with them, start engaging them in service and ministry. You know, maybe the preacher needs to take them when this is a thing, you know, COVID's hard, to, to places to visit and to experience these kinds of things so they can kind of see the fulfilling life of ministry because it is very fulfilling. It's challenging, yes, but it is actually a very fulfilling life. And it's one of the greatest things a human being could ever possibly do. And I'm blessed uh, to be able to be in the position that I'm in. And I should never take that for granted. And last, we need prayer. We truly need prayer that God would show us the way to a future and a reality that is vibrant, that is growing, that is thriving, that when people come and they experience what's happening in our congregations, that they truly feel like they've been with Jesus. And that would be a wonderful thing. So these are some of my thoughts on this. It's, it's gonna be a growing problem over time because our pipeline, something's gonna to have to change in the culture of our, of our churches to bring about a vibrant culture of mission and support and love so that then people feel comfortable to encourage their young people to equip them and bring them along. You see, don't wait till seminary to get equipped for ministry. You do that when you're young. You get equipped for ministry when you're in your teen years so that you then have that interest when you come into your formative college years and graduate uh, years so that you can get the kind of training that you need. And some people do it in their 30s and 40s and they come back around for ministry as a second career. That happens. And that may be part of why we also have an aging ministerial population. But I, I just encourage you to be on the lookout for people who have the giftedness and fan that flame, as Paul said to Timothy, fan that flame in, in them. Fan that flame in them and encourage them and cast a vision for them that, that they could actually be about the mission of God through the life of the church to, in, to equip people and encourage people and bless people and send people to use their giftedness too. And wonderful things will happen. And I think there's great days ahead. It's going to come with some challenge, but God is in this and he is faithful and he will see us through to the end. And so where we are seemingly going to be lacking with maybe a lack of people in paid professional ministry positions, God's gonna fill that gap in, in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. And that's why we need to fast and pray and ask God to make clear to us the path to a future that is vibrant, that is nimble, that, that is um, not stagnant, it is not tired, but is energized with the power of the Spirit, walking with Jesus into changing the world. That's something I can get excited about, and I bet you can too. So thanks for watching. Love if you would subscribe, and if you don't, that's cool too. But, you know, we're growing. We're at 1,550 plus subscribers. Man, we're looking for that 1,700 number. At 1,700, we're going to offer another book giveaway. We'll do that again at 1,900 and 2,100 and 2,300 till we hit 2,500. I, I can't believe we're less than 1,000 away from, from 2,500. How cool is that? God continues to bless this ministry through people like you, and so I'm so appreciative that you've watched for 20 plus minutes of this video. Uh, I hope it's been encouraging to you and not discouraging to you because I know God is moving and I'm excited by that. Man, thanks for watching. If you need anything at all, man, just let me know in the comments. I'll just be glad to engage you there and we'll talk with you soon. God bless and have a great day.